Many years ago, I read that one of the things that separates human beings from dumb animals is the fact that all humans seem to have an instinct to worship. I don't know if you have ever thought about it, but since then I have thought about this, and it seems to me that it, it is true in every case, in every, in every case that I've been able to, to investigate. I mean, sometimes you find that they, they find these primitive tribes, sometimes who have never been exposed to other human beings for centuries. And yet it seems that no matter where you go, no matter what kinds of people, no matter what the level of civilization, you will find that they all have this in common, that they all have this instinct to worship some kind of God. Another thing that you'll notice that is interesting is that all of these different societies and cultures seem to have different ideas about God. Some of them, to be true, seem to be sim uh, similar. But you'll find that there are so many different ideas about God. And perhaps this demonstrates something that the Bible speaks about. In Job 11 and verse 7 it says, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? And I've thought time and time again that the answer to this question must be a resounding no. I read an article a couple of years ago, an interesting article. This article was written by a man who was a scientist. It, was, it actually appeared in the Jamaican newspaper, the Sunday Gleaner. And this article was written by this scientist. His name was H.C. Lowe. And the title of this article was Creating a World Without End. And it says, Of all the areas of science, the one I least understand and have more passing curiosity about is cosmology. I would not be surprised if this is the position not only with other persons of science, but also the intellectuals who are fascinated by science. Perhaps my view is influenced significantly by my frustrating search to get answers to some of the basic questions about life in general and the universe in particular. For example, as a scientist, I have always accepted the Big Bang theory of how the universe was formed because the theory has good and compelling scientific and mathematical logic. However, the question which still remains is, what was there before the Big Bang? Well, in recent times, I have become a little more comfortable about the formation of the universe when I read a report that Professor Stephen Hawking a mathematics professor at Cambridge University seems to be developing the answer. Many of his colleagues have stated that Hawking may have solved the greatest mystery ever, that of the universe, with his theory of how time began. Hawking, now regarded as one of the greatest scientific thinkers since Albert Einstein, published a book, A Brief History of Time, which attempted to explain the cause of the Big Bang, which created the universe. Mr. Hawking believed that just immediately prior to the Big Bang, the universe was about the size of a pea, suspended in a timeless void, which then exploded to form the planets, solar systems, etc., and will keep on and will forever be expanding to infinity. The big question which Mr. Hawking and his colleagues cannot answer is how did this pea-like universe come about? They believe it must have been due to a creator. This is the biggest challenge to man's intellect in demanding that there must either be a denial or a, of a creator due to ignorance or the acceptance of a creator based on the facts available. I believe this has to be where science and faith meet, and I am prepared to accept this explanation, which now makes me more comfortable in my search for truth in this matter. Well, you know, I read this article, and I found it very interesting, but I think it so graphically illustrates the point I'm trying to make, which is 
that human beings cannot by themselves, human beings cannot by searching find out God. The, 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 the abundance of different ideas about God should convince us about this. Here is this man who, I suppose, is regarded as being one of the most intelligent, the most highly learned men on the face of the earth. In fact, his colleagues believe this man to be another Einstein, it says. And yet this man has concluded that there is a God who exists, but this God is capable of creating a pea. A universe the size of a pea. But he, he did not create. The God that he believes in, it seems to me, was not capable of creating these worlds and stars and suns and systems. This immense universe. But he was capable of presenting a pea. Some people, in their speculations about God, have come to the conclusion that he is probably female. Some people believe God is, God is something that can be worshipped in the trees, in stones, in the sun. And, and, and the point I'm making really is that we cannot by searching find out God. If we want to discover who God is, we need to go to some source, some authoritative source. And every Christian believes that in the Bible, God has revealed himself has revealed himself in a way that we can have a clear understanding of who he is and that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible reveals God as a being of infinite power. And I suppose, you know, when we, when we use this word infinite, it's a word that we use so often that sometimes we don't stop, we don't pause to think what it really means. But the word infinite really carries the idea of endlessness and that in itself is an awesome idea that there should exist a being who is truly endless in terms of his power infinite in every respect and yet this is the kind of being that the Bible demonstrates God to be I'll just read a few verses or I'll just quote a few verses Isaiah 40 and verse 26 says Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Here we see the Bible says that God is not just a being who creates these things, but he knows the name of every star in the universe and that he is the one who upholds these heavenly bodies it says for that he is strong in power not one faileth God is responsible not only for creating but maintaining the universe in chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 it says remember the former things of old for I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Here we see that God declares himself to be a, a person who knows all things. The end from the beginning, it says, before things happen and into the infinity of the future, God knows all things. And his word, it says, shall stand. He will do all his pleasure. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, he declares himself to be a being who lives from everlasting to everlasting. Moses says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. When I read these verses, when I meditate on these verses, I am filled with a kind of awe that I cannot explain. And the question comes into my mind, who is this God? And that is what I want to talk about today. Who is this God? Who is this God of the Bible? I'm not going to talk about human speculations. Because I think I've demonstrated that human speculation has led to concepts about God that are as diverse as there are people upon earth. But what we want to know is the truth. Who is God? 
And every, for every Christian, this must be a very important question because, you know, Jesus did say that those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus did say that the first and the greatest commandment is that we should love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. Who is this God of the Bible? I think it's a very important question and I want us to look at what the Bible says. What do we mean when we say God? And what does the Bible mean when the Bible writer, writers speak about God? I think this is such an important question because as I have examined this question, I have come to discover something and I'm going to say this and I'm going to ask you to think about what I'm saying. When most Christians speak about God, Please think about what I'm saying very carefully. When most Christians speak about God, they are speaking about a concept that is different from the Bible concept of God. I'm going to demonstrate my point in a moment. Let me begin by reading from the Encarta Encyclopedia, the article entitled Trinity. I'm just reading a portion of this article. But it says, speaking of the Trinity, which is the concept of God that most Christians embrace. It says in Christian theology, God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are united in one substance or being. Now I want to expand on that a little bit. I want to just to, I want just to make that definition a little clearer. You have, I have discovered, basically three different concepts of the Trinity. Well, at least three. I don't know, there may be more. But I've discovered three concepts of the Trinity that are very, very popular in Christendom today. First of all, there is what I call the, what I would call the traditional or the orthodox Trinity. And this is what the, the Encarta was talking about. The Orthodox Trinity teaches that there is one being or one substance which is inhabited by three persons. Now, this is where we need to be very careful because I have found out that when theologians use certain words, they don't mean the same things that they mean when ordinary people use those same words. Example in this concept of the Trinity, the word persons is supposed to mean something that it means in no other usage in all of human experience. Now you know a person is the same as a being. However, the concept of the Trinity says that there is one substance which is called a being, one substance which is God. And inside of that substance there are three persons. And the word persons does not mean individual, individual people, different as we understand the concept. But in some mysterious way, there are, they are simply manifestations or different aspects of this one substance called God. Now I know I didn't say that in a way that is easy to understand and perhaps there's a reason for this. Because the most, the most forceful exponents of the Trinity doctrine the most convicted teachers of the Trinity will tell you that the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery. It's something that cannot be explained because there is nothing in human experience that can be compared to the Trinity. And therefore, it's a mystery. And you should not find it surprising then if it is difficult to explain. But basically, that is a traditional or orthodox concept of the Trinity. But there's also another idea which says that God is one person. And that this one person has three different ways of manifesting himself at different times. At one time he manifests himself as father. At another time he manifests himself as son. And another time he reveals himself as Holy Spirit. I think historically this concept, this concept was referred to as Sabellianism. Because, of, because the man who originated this idea was called Sabellius, if I remember correctly. 
But today we know it better, or most people who believe this today are commonly referred to as the Jesus only people. Then there's another concept of the Trinity, which basically when you look at it and examine it honestly, really is a teaching that there are three gods. This concept says that there is only one God. But in actual fact, by definition, it teaches three gods. In this definition of the Trinity, there are three independent beings who have always lived together from the years of eternity. Three beings who just happen to be there, living together in harmony, in perfect agreement in everything. And because of this harmony and agreement, these three beings who were equally powerful, equally eternal, equally all-knowing, actually formed a kind of committee that was called God. Now I took a little time to explain all of this because I want you to understand I wanted you to see or I want you to understand that when the Bible says God it doesn't mean the same thing as many Christians today mean where they say God. And today we want to get to the biblical definition of God because I'll tell you our concepts and our worship will never be the way God wants it to be until we accept what the Bible says instead of trying to impose our ideas upon the Bible let the Bible speak to us let the Bible teach us let us not allow tradition let us not allow culture or even 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 allow ourselves to be intimidated by people who perhaps are more learned or who have multitudes behind them let us deal with what the Bible says and accept what the Bible says that is the only safe rule of practice for any Christian what does the Bible mean when it says God well I'm going to put a challenge to you and I'm going to ask you if, if there's anybody who is who listens to this message and wishes to take me up on this challenge I'll be happy to hear from you but I'm going to put a challenge to you and the challenge is this I have never found any place in the Bible and if you can find any such place I'll be glad to hear about it I have never found any place in the Bible where the word God ever refers to more than one individual I have never found it and if anybody can find any such place I'll be happy to hear from you but that in itself, just, just stated like that, is a striking thing to think about. Most Christians in the world today believe in a God who, according to the, to the Encarta Encyclopedia, is a threefold being. Most Christians will tell you that God is three beings, three persons. And yet the Bible never ever uses the word any place to speak of any, to speak of more than one being or one person. Now let me just clarify something here. Many persons have said to me, well, what about the word Elohim? They say that the word Elohim is used in the Old Testament. And Elohim is a plural, it's a plural form of the word El which means God and they say Elohim clearly means gods and since the word Elohim is used very often hundreds of times I think in the Old Testament to refer to God then clearly God was trying to say to people that he was more than one person let's just think about that for a moment first of all the word Elohim is a Hebrew word and I suppose the people in the entire world who are best qualified to understand the Hebrew language is the Jews interestingly the Jews have never since their inception as a nation until this very day they have never believed in a God who was composed of more than one person now I don't know it seems strange to me that people should come along today or even 2000 years ago and study the Hebrew language and find meaning in the Hebrew language which was formulated by the Hebrews and they find some meaning in the Hebrew language that the Hebrews themselves never found nor intended should be there that seems to me to be 
something totally irrational and illogical. If the word Elohim spoke of more than one person, then surely the people who should have, should have understood were the Jews. And yet even today, the most basic tenet of the Hebrew faith is found in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Secondly, as we look at the word Elohim, several times it's used in the Old Testament to refer to beings other than God. And it is used in such a way to make it clear that it is speaking of a single individual. Let me just give you a couple of examples. In Exodus 7 and verse 1, when God was sending Moses in to Pharaoh, he says to Moses, Exodus 7 and verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. And the word God here is from the word Elohim. I have made thee a Elohim to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Was God saying to Moses, I have made you a gods to Pharaoh? Did he make Moses into a plural being? Perhaps into a trinity? And we find the same thing happening in several places. In Judges 16 and verse 23, it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god. Again, the word uses, used is Elohim. And it says, they came together to rejoice, for they said, Our God, that is Elohim, hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And there are a couple of other places, but these will serve to, to illustrate my point. In Judges 16 and verse 24, in 1 Kings 18 and verse 27, we also find Elijah on Mount Carmel. And he says to the prophets of Baal, Cry aloud, for he is a God, he is an, he is an Elohim. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. So the point I'm making is that it is clear that the word Elohim is not always used to refer to more than one being or more than one God. It should be very clear to us that if the word Elohim means gods, then it is not true that there is only one God. When God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord our God is one Elohim. It would mean the Lord our God is one God's. It would be talking about more than one God. The great fundamental principle of Judaism, of Islam, and of Christianity that there is only one God would be contradicted by this single word in the Old Testament. In actual fact, many Bible scholars believe that the word Elohim and I, I, I mean, it should be evident that the word Elohim is simply, is simply used to, to, to bring out the divine majesty. I mean, when I was in high school, my teacher taught me that the word, that, that kings and rulers often used what was called the royal plural. And as I studied Shakespeare and English, English literature, I found it to be true. Many times they would say, we, our us when referring to themselves as an individual for example do not put your hand on our person because kings somehow seemed to take to themselves the, the prerogative it seemed to add something to the idea of their greatness when they spoke of themselves in this plural form and many scholars believe that this is simply why the word Elohim is used with reference to God and the, in, in these other places that, that were mentioned. Because you see, it's very clear that it could not have been speaking of more than one being. This is the only justification that some can find in the Bible to say that the word God means more than one individual. You cannot find it in any other place in the Bible. And like I said, I'm throwing out this challenge with a confident expectation that I will not be proven wrong. If we go to the New Testament, I would suppose that the most logical place that we should turn if we want to discover what does the Bible say about God is to turn to the most authoritative source. There is one person above all others who knows 
what God is like. And let me read his credentials, or let us read his credentials together. I'm reading from John 1 and verse 18. And it says simply, No man had seen God at any time. Well, if no man has seen God at any time, then no man is qualified to say who God is. No man is qualified to speak. The verse continues. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Who is qualified to speak about God? The one who is in the bosom of God, He has declared Him. No man has seen God at any time, but the one who has seen God surely knows who God is. In John 6 and verse 46, the same truth is brought out. Jesus says, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. And then in John 3 verses 11 to 13, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Truly, truly, I'm telling you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. In other words, I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I have seen. I'm not speculating. I'm not going by rumor. I'm not going by what somebody says. I'm talking about what I have seen and what I know. He goes on to say, And ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I mean, I don't need to emphasize this point too much, but I've quoted these three verses or three passages because I just want to make the point very clear. If we cannot believe the testimony of Jesus concerning God, it's very foolish to believe anything else. The only being who ever came down from heaven to teach men is Christ himself. And I want us to look at a few striking places where Jesus spoke concerning God in ways that cannot be mistaken. And interestingly, he never ever in any of these places suggested that God was any other than a single being. In Matthew 11 verse 25, he answers the question of who is Lord of heaven and earth. He says, it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father. Here he makes it clear that he was speaking to God the Father. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus says that the Lord, the ruler of not only earth, but heaven also, is the one that he calls Father. I thank thee because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. And has revealed them unto babes. In John 4 and verse 23. Jesus says. But the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshipper shall worship the father. In spirit and in truth. For the father seeketh such to worship him. This, this incident is a very interesting one. Because Jesus met this woman who wanted to understand better the way of true worship, where to worship, how to worship. And Jesus said specifically, he did not say that, he did not even say that God is seeking for those to worship him. He says specifically, the Father is the one that men will worship in spirit and in truth. Not a trinity, not even the Holy Spirit. But he says, they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But who will do this? The true worshippers. We cannot discount this evidence and I'm going to tell you, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John from beginning to end and you'll find that in every place this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. If we cannot believe Jesus, who are we going to believe? In John 17 and verse 3, Jesus says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And I want to ask you, when he said the only true God, did he mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If he meant this, why does he then add, and Jesus Christ? He cannot be here including Jesus Christ. 
when he says the only true God. Otherwise, the word and does not make sense. There are two beings he's talking about. You need to know two beings to have eternal life. One of them is the only true God. And the other one is Jesus Christ who was sent by the only true God. In Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13, Jesus says, when you pray, you are to pray like this. He says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven. We are to pray to our Father in heaven. He does not say pray to anybody else. He says, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Whose will is done in heaven? Not the will of a trinity. But the will of the one that Jesus calls Father. He says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he ends by saying, For thine is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to the Father. And the power, the power belongs to the Father. And the glory forever. Amen. Jesus' references to God always applied exclusively to the Father. All his references to himself in the context of being a divine person was always in the context of him being the Son of God. And that's interesting because I've heard so many people say, I've read so many places where people who claim to be Bible students have said that Jesus, they tried to kill Jesus because he claimed to be God. But that is not true. Over and over, and I'll just give two references here. In John 5 and verse 18, and also in John chapter 10, it says that the Jews were about to kill Jesus. They wanted to stone him. He asked the question, for which of my good works are you killing me? Are you going to stone me? They said, we don't stone you for a good work, but because you being a man, make yourself to be God. And then Jesus goes on to say, do you say I blaspheme because I said I am the son of God? He did not claim to be God. He claimed to be God's son. But the Jews recognized that in saying this, he was claiming he was equal to God in nature. But Jesus never claimed to be God himself. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 22, Jesus says that the one who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and by the one who sits on it. It is very clear that Jesus knew that one person sat on the throne of heaven. And he says that this person is God. One person sits on this throne. So there is no question as to what Jesus believed. But what about the apostles and the New Testament writers? What about the disciples who obtained the gospel from Christ himself and who went out into the world to preach the message of Christ and the truth about God. What did they believe? Did they teach the doctrine of a Trinitarian God? Now, this is an important question and I'm asking you, brothers and sisters, as you are listening to me here now, I'm going to ask you some, I'm going to say something to you. Let us be honest with ourselves. You know, I read something interesting in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I read the same thing in the Encarta Encyclopedia and basically the, the same thing in every place that I have studied the history of the Trinity. We are told that the doctrine of the Trinity is not explicit in the New Testament. But that it developed gradually during the first 300 years of the history of the Christian Church. And that it was finally formulated in the 4th century. In fact, the Encarta Encyclopedia almost uses exactly the same words, just as I, I said them up now, just now. now. Now think about this for a moment. Do, do you believe, do we believe, that doctrines, Christian doctrines can evolve? Do we believe that what is true today can gradually become untrue tomorrow? I mean, most Christians that I know, well, at least those who call themselves Protestants, are convicted that the scriptures contain 
the revealed will of God. And that when you come to the end of the scriptures, you have come to the end of God's revelation as far as his will for humanity is concerned. They don't believe that there can be something that comes after the Bible that can change what is already revealed in the Bible. God reveals himself. We can take what is in the scripture, study it, and discover what it is saying, but we cannot go beyond what is in the scripture. But here is a doctrine that all those who have studied carefully will tell you. Developed after the time of the Bible, that says a great deal. And if you go to the New Testament, if you go to the writings of the apostles, you'll find that it is true. It is not there in the New Testament. One of the, the most outstanding contributors to the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. And over and over, over and over, Paul insists that there is only one God. Let me just quote a couple of places. I mean, I, 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 could, I could find dozens of places, but I'll just quote a few. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. He does not even say God the Father, that you might think, well, you know, God the Father is playing one role and Christ is another role. So God the Father is head over God the Son, as some people would say. No, he says the head of Christ is God, period. There is no other God. The, the one single God is the head of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, just in case you think Paul got carried away there in, in, in chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6, Paul says, well, in verse 4 he says that, you know, there are many that are called gods in the world. There are lords many and there are gods many. And then he says, but you know that there is none other God but one. He insists again, he comes back to the basic fundamental. There is no other God but one. There is only one God. Then he says now in verse 6, but to us, us who? He's talking to Christians. To us, there is but one God, the Father. Not one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. One God, he says, the Father. Now, I ask you, if there was a God that was made up, that, that was a threefold consubstantial being, made up of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, what did Paul mean? Paul who stated that the gospel was given to him by Christ himself. Paul who stated... So, so, so dogmatically that what he preached was a pure gospel. What did he mean by deceiving us, confusing us, by saying the only God, the one God is the Father? You know, some people are some, the, the, the way some people have interpreted God or have tried to interpret the Bible would, would, lead, would lead to the conclusion that in the scriptures, God is not trying to enlighten us, but rather he is trying to confuse us. If God was made up of three persons, why didn't God just say so? Didn't Jesus come to make the, the, the things of the Old Testament plain? Didn't the apostles go out explaining what Christ was about and what the gospel was about? If there was any truth that should have been known to God's people, should they not have made it known? Should they not, they not have made it clear? And yet here is Paul saying... But to us, there is but one God, the Father. And again, just to be certain that he's not talking about Jesus Christ, he says, Of whom are all things and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. The one Lord is not the one God. The one God is not the one Lord. They are different beings. In Ephesians 4 and verse 6, he says the same thing. He says there is one God and Father of all. Not one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but one God and Father of all, who is above all. There is none equal to him. This, brothers and sisters, is the Bible definition of God. John is another contributor to the New Testament. And I'll just quote a couple of verses from John. John says in 1 John 4 and verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, 
God dwelleth in him and he, is God, and he in God. Not whoever confesses that Jesus is God, but whoever confesses that he is the Son of God. Again, you see John teaches that there is only one God. He says in 2 John 1 verse 3, Grace be with you and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The point, brothers and sisters, and it could be made over and over again, is that there is only one, when the Bible speaks of God, it means one being only. And I'm going to go to the last book in the Bible. If there is any place that God was going to reveal to his church that he was a threefold consubstantial beings or any form of a trinity, surely Revelation is the place to do it. It was the last book written by the last of the apostles left, left alive 95 years after Christ was born. In this book, you would expect that any changes that were to be made or any corrections or any, any clarifications would have been done. But strangely, when we go to the book of Revelation, we find even more forcefully this great insistence that there is only one God, one being. In the book of Revelation, you see God draws the veil aside. We are taken into heaven and we are, given, we are given a glimpse of heavenly things. In fact, I find the book of Revelation to be very interesting because in Revelation I get an idea of how they worship in heaven. You know, you remember Jesus said that we should pray. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, if we want to understand how God's will is done in heaven, the book of Revelation is a good place to start. I'd like us to just quickly look at chapter 4. And I want to read from verses 9 to 11. It says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. Now, you see here that in heaven, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, are worshipping an individual. This individual is said to be the one who sits on the throne. And it is said about this person, you have created all things. They were created for your pleasure. Now, when you read this, your mind might go immediately to John chapter 1 and verse 3, where it says that all things were created by Jesus Christ, and without him was nothing made that was made. And you might jump to the conclusion that therefore this person that is being worshipped here in Revelation must be Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says this person on the throne is the one who created all things. But you know Jesus said that whosoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by the one who sits on it. He makes it clear that God sits on the throne of heaven. And we have been saying that this person is not Jesus Christ, it is his Father. So what is the meaning of this statement that thou hast created all things? If you go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, it's very simple. In Ephesians 3 and verse 9, we are told very simply that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Simple! And just to explain what that means, I am here today presenting this message. I don't know, I don't know whether this is blessing anybody, but I hope it is. But whatever blessing is coming from this message, is it coming from David Clayton? Or is it coming from God? You know, if, if this message really blesses anybody, I could say, God spoke to you. 
But in actual fact, whose mouth was moving? Whose vocal cords were working? Whose hands were being agitated? It was David Clayton's. And yet, if the Spirit of God is working through me, if the power of God is, is coming through me, then truly, it is God who is doing the work. And once you understand it, it is not difficult to understand why the Bible says God created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did the actual work, but it was the power of God through him. All things were made ultimately by God the Father. And that is why in Revelation chapter 4, he is given all this praise and exaltation and the credit for being the creator of all. In Revelation 4 and verse 2, we find that there is only one person sitting on this throne. You know, I'm mentioning this point because a couple of years ago, I read an article by a fellow Christian. And this person stated that there were two persons sitting on God's throne. And I suppose if, if he had had the time to expand on his article, he would have said there were three persons sitting on the throne. But here we find that when we are, are, are taken into heaven and given a view of the, that throne room, John says, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. One being sat on the throne. And this is the person that is being worshipped in heaven. In Revelation 7 verses 9 to 12, we find an interesting scene. We find that the people of earth are finally redeemed. They are in heaven. Every Christian is going to be there one day. But I'll tell you something. The people who are redeemed finally are not in any question as to who is God. Let us read what it says here in Revelation 7 verses 9 to 12. It says, And after this I beheld... And lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Now look carefully at what the redeemed say. These people are not confused. They are not in any question as to who God is. Listen to what they say. Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The redeemed know that God is the one who sits on the throne. The redeemed know that Jesus is the Lamb of God but not God himself. It continues by saying, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Who do they worship? If you read the book of Revelation, you can be in no question that when it says they worshipped God, it means they worshipped the one that sat on the throne. And they say, Amen! When the redeemed worship, when the redeemed say, Salvation to our God that sits on the throne and to the Lamb, all the hosts of heaven fall down and they say, they worship God and they say, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. In Revelation 12 and verse 10, and you know, I'm just, I'm just scanning through the book. I'm just picking on a verse here and there. But if you read the book from Revelation 1, verse 1, to Revelation 22, and the last verse, you'll find that consistently there is never anybody who is called God in Revelation but the Father, the one who sits on the throne. That is God's final revelation to mankind in the Holy Bible. This should tell you that the, the doctrine of the Trinity has some origin outside of the Bible. God is not trying to say in the Bible, I am a trinity. And if God is trying to say, I am a trinity, why did not God say so? Why did Jesus say, you are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Worship the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Why didn't he say, worship Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Why didn't Paul say, but unto us there is but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Why did God leave this thing so veiled in darkness? That it took 300 years for learned men to come together and debate. And it took a worldly emperor to make the final decision as to which doctrine about God should be accepted by Christians. 
No. The Bible is very clear. And if we believe the Bible, there's no need for confusion on the question, who is God? In Revelation 12 and verse 10, we find again a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. There's our God and there is his Christ. There is the Christ of our God. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. In Revelation 16 and verse 11, it says that they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Consistently, God in Revelation is just one individual. Revelation 19 and verse 1 says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. The redeemed know who God is. And so do the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures. In Revelation 19 verses 4 to 6, again the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down, before, fell down and worshipped God. Who is God? And worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And of course, in Revelation 21 and verse 22, it says simply, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord God Almighty is one. The Lamb is another. They both are the temple of it. You know, one of the things that is very striking here, I've been talking quite a bit about God, and I've mentioned His Son, Jesus Christ. But one of the things that is very striking is that in all of these passages that we have read, which have spoken about the one true God, the only God, worshipping God, you find that there is no mention of another being called the Holy Spirit. There is no suggestion of worshipping such a being, or of praising such a being, or of giving glory to such a being. That in itself speaks volumes. Most of us who are listening to this message are probably people who believe in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Who believe that there is a message that is to go to the world in the last days, described in verses 6 to 10 of Revelation 14. You know, I was reading over these verses again recently, and something struck me as I read them. Because, you know, the first message speaks about the hour of God's judgment has come. And we emphasize that a great deal. And the second message says that Babylon is fallen. And we emphasize that also a lot. And the third message says, The man who worships the beast is going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. And we talk about that a lot as well. But I looked at these messages and I asked myself the question, well, here is a warning, here's a warning, here's a warning. What am I supposed to do? Because does it make sense to say, this is going to happen, and not tell me what I am supposed to do? How am I to escape all of this? And it is interesting that when you look at these three messages, there is only one command that is given in these messages. In verse 6, it says that an angel flies in the midst of heaven and he has the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But look at what the angel says. Saying with a loud voice, A, for God. B, give glory to him. Then it says the hour of his judgment is come. That is not a command. That's a statement of something, a fact, that something is happening. But he continues, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That is the only command in the three angels' messages. Let's, let, let, let's look at it again. A. Fear God. B. Give glory to God. C. Worship God. 
the one who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. In other words, brothers and sisters, what I see here is that the three angels' messages carries a strong command. The only way to escape the crisis that is coming is to worship God, fear God, give glory to God. And if you don't know who God is, how can you fulfill that command? And I, I, I want to say to you that in order to, to properly understand this passage, we must look at it especially in the context of Revelation. And I un encourage you again, go back to Revelation 1 and read to Revelation 22 and find out who is the God of Revelation. Who is called God and worshipped as God in Revelation. That is the one that is spoken about in the three angels' messages. God has a dream for this earth. Jesus spoke about it when he said that we should pray, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God has a dream. Everything that God has ever tried to do among men on this planet, from the very inception of the existence of humanity, from the very beginning, God's plan has been that his will shall be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Isaiah 11 and verse 9, God enunciated his dream in this way. He says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Brothers and sisters, one day this world is going to be filled with the knowledge of God. It's going to be full of the knowledge of the true God. There will come a time when all these confusing ideas about a God who can create a pea but not a universe, about female gods, about gods that, 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 that live in stone and wood and trees, all of these ideas shall be clarified forever. There shall exist a people who don't have any confusion about who God is. Who know the identity of the being that they worshipped. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then God's will shall be done in, in, in earth as it is done in heaven. Then when men speak of God, their concept will be equal to the concept of heavenly beings. I want to say to you that if you are to be a part of God's purpose in this world, especially in these closing moments of time, in these closing moments, when God is trying to bring all his people to a complete understanding of his will for their lives, we need to have a true concept of God. And I know that on this tip, we have not dealt with all the issues. We have barely brushed the surface. But I say to you, there is enough here to cause you to think, enough here to lead you to go and study the scriptures without the bondage of human bias and tradition. And if you do this, you will find that it will be very, very clear who God is. And this is what I hope all of us will do. May God continue to bless you and by his spirit to guide you into all truth. God bless you.